Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Solutions to Five Known Revit Challenges webinar today uh, with AIA Miami. We are very excited to have you guys all here with us today. Um, before we do go ahead and get started, I'm going to have uh, Roger go ahead and jump over to that next slide for me. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about some logistics here. So all attendee lines will be muted throughout the presentation. Uh, you can send us your questions via the chat box throughout the presentation, but we will be answering them at the very end. Um, but do definitely go ahead and send us those questions as the presentation goes on so you don't forget. Um, additionally, if you're, uh, if you're looking to receive your AIA credits for, for being here at Continuing Education Credits, please do make sure that you go ahead and send us your name and AIA number in the chat box as well, and we will keep track of all of that. Um, okay, lastly, the webinar will be recorded and um, you should receive a copy of that after the presentation. Additionally, we do, uh, you should be able to find that on our website or our YouTube channel as well. Um, okay, last thing here, if you have any questions, concerns, anything like that, uh, you know, go ahead and give us a call here at 305-445-6480 or email us at info at ddscat.com. Okay, so Roger, go ahead and now jump over to that next slide. And so I want to go ahead and present our uh, speaker for today, uh, Roger Mujica. He is one of our expert trainers uh, with expertise in a variety of different areas, including Revit, 3D Studio Max, AutoCAD, Inventor, and Navisworks. And in addition to the training that he does for us, he's uh, provided support to develop, integrate, and implement new strategies to improve productivity, enhance organizational skills, and maximize employee performance. So uh, without further ado, Roger, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate that, and thank you for the presentation of me. Um, yes, uh, we're gonna have this interesting webinar today. I'm very excited about it because uh, it's something that I like to discuss and talk with my trainees and people in general. It's about challenges that we always face when we are actually working in Revit, especially when we are kind of brand new in Revy, or we don't have that all of the facts or knowledge of Revy. Uh, this challenge usually pose even to advanced people, advanced people that are knows Revy already. So how uh, we can overcome this and find the solutions? What we're going to try to discuss here. So I'm going to do my best to uh, provide you guys with the best solutions possible. So those challenges are there. So find the first one is it's find the right appreciation for how Revit works and differs from AutoCAD and Revit. This is a, probably one of the top one and hot topic because people are still trying to use Revit as an AutoCAD and then people start to get a little bit annoying about it and Revit do things different than AutoCAD. So you need to kind of understand that part from the get-go. Once you actually overcome that uh, challenge and solution to understand that, then you're going to be able to understand and work better in your project, whatever it is, architecture, design, structural, MEP. Uh, other challenge the name of other people has is that uh, trying to over modeling in Revit. So there are the other stream. I mean, people try to over modeling that uh, models and then that start becomes a little bit annoying, especially big projects. Uh, other issues with visibility graphics overrides. Who doesn't have any issues with visibility graphics overrides? All of us. In, encounter that situation in one point or the other in our projects. And uh, also one channel is very common, and uh, the number four, no, because it's the number four is less important, is the lack of company standards in a project template. That is a very common challenge that many companies face, uh, and they realize that along the way, no at the beginning of the project, uh, working with Red. And many people have some frustration with uh, browser organization, naming conventions, etc. It's kind of linked together these two guys here. So, but let's let's see one by one. So the first challenge is that. So what's the difference between Revit and AutoCAD? I have these two little guys there, try to fight one against the other, who is best, who is the, the, the worst. So just to let you know, both of them are great. Both of them are good. AutoCAD is a great program. Revit is a great program as well. Is not who is better than the other one. It's just the way that each one works differently. You know, so when we appreciate the difference, the difference between AutoCAD and Revit, we start to understand how to work with Revit better. 
So AutoCAD is a computer design program. So it's a, a software that can be used for general design and technical documentation and can be used in a broad applications, uh, anything from manufacturer design all the way even to uh, even in fashion design. Whereas in Revit, we need to understand that not only is a 3D modeling based process intelligent uh, program, the, the elements of the building uh, elements are connecting one to the other, but it's also related more to AC industry, architecture, construction, and engineering industry. So it's no broad application like AutoCAD. So understanding this different, it will help you a little bit more in that. Understanding more is this. So when we work in a program like AutoCAD and what can we do is usually it's a 2D environment. Uh, what happens is when we work in AutoCAD uh, and we start to do the drawings or the views, each one of them is independent. They are not connected together. They're not integrated. And so for other uh, um, part of the, the entire journey of the project is not integrated like uh, for example you know a uh, schedule a uh, scheduling of uh, elements and and the even the construction uh, also you know progress of that none of them these are integrated so what, what happened when we work into the environment like AutoCAD that we need to rework a lot when we actually need to do some changes and some updates to whatever the part of the process of the design that is the way of the nature of AutoCAD. Whereas in Revit, we don't need to do that because Revit is an integrated software that can allow us to do a lot of things together and then we can actually uh, be more productive because things are connecting together, things are uh, work together and when I do a change in any place, automatically this will you know, go along the way and the other outsource uh, elements like uh, scheduling, uh, you know, the process of the uh, construction itself, and even the graphy aspect of, the, of that. For example, if I change this window, immediately gonna, uh, you know, notify the manufacturer whether the window that we need now is available or not. And if it's not, then the manufacturer can immediately give us a, a schedule different dates. And all of that integration works very nicely throughout the process and that what it makes the difference between Revit and AutoCAD. So uh, that difference makes it the fact that we need to get to know Revit better and do not expect to work like AutoCAD or vice versa. How many people want the AutoCAD to work like Revit? So let me go back and jump in to show you a, a, a couple of interesting things there. For example, in AutoCAD, uh, when we have a project, this is a kind of decent project in AutoCAD, we can have some, Usually the floor plans and the elevations uh, here, very nice organized. But uh, AutoCAD usually has some, uh, the system that we organize elements are by layers and you can tell there's something kind of not nice here. Uh, even though there is the same window, there is something here that is not right. It's because there is not integrated here. So if you notice here, if I select this window, this is on the layer A glass, but if I Select this other block is actually in another different layer. And that happens very often in AutoCAD. So I need to kind of go there, A glass, and look for that guy and change that guy to make sure that it's in the right location or in the right layer, better to say, so that things go well. And what happens sometimes is, uh, I don't see it, that uh, we waste time, you know, trying to do that. This is the same situations. So I need to kind of do that here even the match property works very nice here and many of you maybe are using this but then what happened if i need now to notice that i would like to this guy here as per my design is probably i needed to move it maybe two or three feet i'm gonna move this one feet over this side, so now notice here all of this integration that I need to kind of organize here. That's okay, because this is graphic design. But what happened here in my uh, elevation looks good, but now I need to go to the actual here floor plan and fix it. 
because here it's not fixed. I need now to select these guys and physically move it, you know, to a uh, one foot, 12 inches on the side. It's not integrated. It doesn't do it automatic and actually do all of this. Guy. What happens sometimes we forget. We've, we, we were focused on the elevation. We did good. We forget to change it here. And then voila, when we have the floor plan print, we realize these guys were not moving together and even here the site plan I need to go and do that too. In Revit though we don't have to worry about that. In Revit the integration of these guys works nicely and together. For example here if I will go to this elevation um, I can tell that hmm, these windows are not really in the right side but I want to just see something here. So if I go here and tile this with a floor plan so that I can see the different these windows here and these windows there in the south. So I'm going to tile this side by side and I'm going to show you how this integration works very nice. So if I start to here move, move this guy a little bit on my side, maybe one foot, the same movement, maybe two feet. Then you can tell that this guy is automatically integrated and move it. Now I start to be a little more happy. I can even do it here on the floor plan now. I can move this other guy and move this guy maybe three feet. And then this guy starts to look good there, but it also here is already 1.6 more and it's already fixed. Now this is good because uh, I have these guys already organized but if you look at it the door schedule here tell me all of those doors for some reason and windows i don't have the the, the windows there but I, I do have some doors here if what happened if i want to this door i feel it's too big so i'm gonna change it automatic to another one here that door schedule automatic change here as well and also here if I go to back here, it changed now my door schedule there. If I want to identify this guy, so I can go here and see where this guy is here. What's the number of this guy? This is the number 32. If I go here to the 32, that's the guy that was originally in a different size. And you're going to see this 64 by 98 now. This is the exact door that is here, 64 by 98. So everything integrated goes together. And that is what the beautiful thing about, you know, Revy, how we really can um, appreciate those different changes. Now, talking about the second challenge that we have is this challenge that many Revy uh, users start to face at the beginning or later along the way is uh, how to avoid over modeling and what are the pros and the cons of doing that. Well, when we actually have a good model, we're going to have energy efficiency design, um, communicate the design in much, much, much effectively easy and actually do the things in a way that can uh, benefit all of the uh, stakeholders of the project. We can have multiple contributors or collaborators that can access those files automatically and easily and share those models um, a lot well in between them. There are no need for repetition, no need to uh, create different multiple copies of the model for each individual stakeholder that's going to be participating in the project. So we actually can uh, have a central file that can be utilized by all of the stakeholders at and the collaborators at the same time and work at the same time simultaneously if we do not over modeling and that's the part of the issue here not over modeling means to not duplicate the same model over and over again for every single discipline or every single collaborator and the parametric components that the building has this is amazing it's a fully coordinated building i i showed you that earlier when i select the window i changed the window size the uh, parameter change aromatic and that actually can change. If that schedule doors has also even the manufacturer, the manufacturer have a specific 
a code of serial number for that particular uh, door with this particular uh, cost, that will change and automatically update the cost of my building. So this is all the pros that we have when we modeling uh, properly in, in Revy and don't necessarily over modeling the, the, the project and not even duplicating things. On the contrary, we have some cons against the modeling, uh, over modeling the project. Uh, we will have difficulty in understanding the execution of the building itself. So, you know, having all of the information beforehand can delay the way that we can approach to uh, do the model. And then sometimes we tend to over model the, the, the project and bringing in a lot of information that probably not necessarily is needed. Families overloaded the project with families. Now, the fact that Revy is so popular and the level of ready to work, there are no need uh, um, for real specialization training. So sometimes people think that uh, having a training is not necessarily for ready and then start to over model the ready uh, file or connect it with other things, but having a really good specialized training will uh, help not to be modeling over the, the project. And many people have this tendency to, to have heavy focus on structural design and structural elements and not necessarily for structural, but also mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. They have this over heavy focus on those little details that sometimes it's better to leave it to uh, another, another phase of the project itself. So this is important to know because sometimes people get into that trap. So what I'm talking about over modeling here is here. So if I go here and show you something, let me see here if I open this file, that we sometimes gonna be doing also this part of this model that in the beginning we started to do so ah, uh, this was in an early version of Revy, so I need to open Revy 2023. But I would like to uh, show you that that we can actually have a, some uh, elements there that can be really easy to work when we model uh, our elements or, pro or projects there. So having the first stage of uh, understanding how Revy works and the design itself, you can do uh, massive design and start to understand and study the building prior to over model the building with a lot of information that is not needed in that first stage, especially in the schematic stage. Uh, many times people have that tendency to uh, create the models, even documentation, without having all of the facts. But in Revy, we have something beautiful, is um, mass in design, and then we can start to, you know, understand this massing element in the building, and large building like this one that I'm gonna show you right now, so that you can see that uh, you can keep the building light, your model light, and all of the stakeholders, people, and collaborators, you know, understanding the real intent design here. So when we do that, we can see that the building is, is actually accomplished whatever the design intent is and whatever even you know energy code is needed for the location of the building. You can tell that it has some you know, curtain walls, it's a completely glass building, but it's actually something that you can study and you know, over uh, look at it uh, without the need to compromise over modeling the building itself. And that is very important to understand when we are actually in that stage. Now, talking about our challenge, one of the challenges, and many of you will agree with me, and might be interesting in, in, in understand a little bit of the issues that we face with the graphic uh, design display. So uh, I always say a couple of interesting things, you know, from when I, I do work with people, uh, as a consultant or when I teach Revy, uh, the second most uh, common 
terminology that we use in Revit, so uh, visibility graph is overrides. And here they are. This is sometimes it's a nightmare for many people, visibility graph is overrides, especially for people who come in with a strong background in, in AutoCAD, because in AutoCAD we use layers here, we use uh, elements, and then these elements are control the visibility by this little uh, box here. So visibility graph is override can be a nightmare for some people and can be a challenge and some people don't, don't get it, don't understand exactly what they are. And there are some questions like this. So uh, should I use a view templates? What are views? What are they? How to use them? Uh, how they related to visibility graph is override. So in visibility graph is override, not necessarily this guy, it's also this graphic display options. I'm gonna see this. And also even filters. Um, showing here an example of filters for uh, MEP, uh, which is, is the most common filters that we can use, but not necessarily for MEP uh, design, but also filters for uh, architecture and structural design. So visibility graphics overrides always a hot topic. And in between that hot topic is the view templates. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. Zoom. And another situation about visibility graphics overrides is this. How many of you people have ever encountered this situation? That you have a Revit link into your model, but then you don't know how to control how to manage the visibility graphics overrides of those elements in the uh, project because you probably you're gonna find out that if you turn off the layer the, the element, for example, doors, all of the doors of the link also turn off and you don't want that to happen. Or vice versa, you want the doors of the link ready uh, only to be turned off but not in your project. So how that, how can we approach to do that? And how can we approach to talk about visibility graphics overrides? So let's talk about first of um, and visibility graphics overrides when it comes to uh, an MEP. So usually what happens is this, you notice here on my um, browser here, this MEP uh, project has all of these disciplines, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing. So for each one of these um, views, the visibility graphics overrides is gonna start to work different. So for example, if I go to my mechanical floor plan, you can tell that I can see elements about mechanical design. I don't have any design whatsoever, but I, I have those guys here. Even if I create a simple um, dot work here, it will automatically you know, be representing here and show here. But if I go to the same floor plan in plumbing, you notice that I don't see anything about those guys there. So that is when visibility graphics override start to be part of it. And um, again, Many people think that visibility graph is is only this one. It's everything related to the properties of the view. Among those properties, and the reason why I don't see now here the dot where it's there, but I don't see it here. If I create here a um, uh, pipe, for example, you know, uh, cold water, I'm gonna do actually hot water, a hot water pipe, a little bit, better if I do it straight, but uh, when I do a cold water you know, pipe here, I see my cold water pipe here, I see my hot water pipe here, but I don't see the part of the mechanical. And the reason is the discipline. So over, uh, visibility graphics overrides all the visibility of the elements and the views depend not only on that, but also you need to see the all, all overall. So it's about the disciplines, it's about the sub discipline in many, especially in for uh, those folks that work with MEP. So the plumbing discipline and the sub discipline in this case, plumbing, you notice here, I have other sub disciplines for power, electrical, lighting for electrical, HVAC for mechanical, et cetera. But notice here, the disciplines also are very well established, AEC you know, architecture, structural, MEP, and coordination. So that is part also the, the, of the visibility graph is override. So you need to keep that in mind. If you go, for example, here to the power floor plan, I don't even see any one of those. I don't see 
electrical uh, elements, or I don't see piping or plumbing elements there, because the idea of these uh, disciplines driven information is toward those elements that is related to electrical power. So whatever I do here for electrical, it will be under this part. It doesn't mean that I cannot see those other elements. If I go to the visibility graphs of override and I need temporarily to see how probably the dot work will interact with maybe some of my conduits here or maybe my cable trays, I'm going to be able in the visibility graphics override to go to the discipline. In this case, I'm going to narrow that to mechanical and then turn on my docks, maybe my dot fittings. And then I'm going to be able to see those guys and see whether these guys are going to have some uh, clash detection or come, you know, crashing with the, any other cable con cable trade or any conduit that I have on my electrical design. So visibility graphics overrides is very, very useful. If I go back again to plumbing, one thing that many people do not uh, know very well is use of filters. So filters are very useful in all of the disciplines, especially I created a lot for interior design. So what I can see, you know, finishes versus I don't want to see all the things there. But I'm going to show you these filters that are coming out of the box here. So you can add, for example, a sanitary or maybe a domestic cold water uh, filter. So notice that immediately is the filter is enabled and the visibility is there. If I turn off this guy and apply, notice that the cold water is gone. Now, how does it work? Because now you can try to understand this a little bit. So what happened is in the model categories for piping, I still have pipes on. And the reason why I need to have this on is because this guy is a pipe too. But now I'm filtering out specific areas of those pipes categories, like uh, cold water and hot, uh, hot water and maybe another uh, elements there. So if I now turn this hot water, domestic cold water and hot water on, apply, now this guy is gone and this guy is gone. Uh, likewise, it happens for architectural design. So the visibility graph is override works well, then if we do have also um, elements of the of floor plans that we want to um, work on them in a specific views, and we can control that by the view templates. For example, here, if you notice here on my project browser, I have a lot of sections here created. So sometimes those sections are needed, but I start to see some certain things that I don't like here to see in this section. For example, I don't like to see these other sections showing here. So I go to my visibility graphics override. I turn off uh, in the architectural all of those sections. And remember, if you turn off the sections, you're not deleting them. It's just the section itself is not visible there. So it looks a lot nicer. So I start to kind of see this much better. And I like this. I like how I have this guy. So probably in the visibility graphics override, I make changes to this. I might like to have just shadows in these sections. And that is part of the this graphic displays option that I showed you earlier so that we can control shadows here. You notice know, here the shadows, I turn it on. And I like that. So in the view tab, I can create a template from this view. And I'm going to call it sections F final. And all of those settings that you have here, you see it's not necessarily visibility, visibility graphics override, but all of those settings are there, including the discipline architecture, even the scale, et cetera. Now that I create that guy, I can apply that to the other guys. So now here again, the same situation, instead of going here now, and then start to go manually, I just go here and apply that section F. And when I do that, this automatic goes and fix this little guy there. So um, view templates is a very useful command. It's very important to use it. And some people don't even um, know exactly how they works. And 
you can start to utilize this to all this. I can apply to all of the sections, whether like this one, go back again and do this guy here, apply the guy, and then automatically my section is ready to be placed in the sheets or in the documents that I want to do, etc. So it's a very easy, convenient way to utilize visibility graphics overrides, kind of storage the settings and the settings include everything that we see here. It's not necessarily turning on and off elements, but other settings, and then you're going to see. What happened, and going back again, I think I close it, and to the case of the um, file that you have a link file behind this, and then you would like to turn off certain things of the link and not necessarily of the um, of the element here is here. If I go here and turn off in this guy, the doors, you're gonna see the doors are gonna turn off there. That's fine. But if you have actually doors here, you probably you don't want it to turn off that doors there. So you have an architectural you know, design that you are working on that, it's not gonna do. The best way to do that is actually manipulating the doors directly on the link ready. So this is a interesting thing. So notice here that the settings of this link is gonna be based on, I'm gonna apply that so the doors go back. It's gonna be based on the host view. So whatever I do here, it will affect automatically the link. But what about if I really wanna do something here? Let me do actually something very interesting here. Quickly, I'm gonna place a air terminal from my end. I'm gonna place this air terminal. Now, this air terminals belongs to the architectural model. I'm gonna place my own air terminals. I don't wanna work with any uh, air terminals from the architects. I'm gonna place one here, one here, one here. I wanna turn off those guys. But again, if I turn off those guys, uh, your terminal, all of them are gonna go. Not only mine, but theirs. Fine, but I need mimes. <laughs> you might say, yeah, fine, but I need mimes. So what happened is here that you need to uh, then approach this in a different way. So that different way is going to the link. And notice that the link, I'm gonna put this here, is actually having by the host. That's why when I turn off the terminal, not only mimes, but those, I want those. So you need to go here and customize now the link visibility graph is overrides. There's a couple of steps here. The first one is customize that. And then second, go to the area that you really wanna customize still. Notice that still is controlled by the host, but I wanna customize that. And then immediately I can turn off the air terminals. For the link, notice here the visibility graph is override for the link only. And if I apply that, I go okay. And then I apply this and notice now that the only air terminals that are there are my air terminals and not the one from the link. And that happens in any discipline. So I'm just showing you a very good example of an MEP, but in architectural, the same thing. If you link one file to the other because you're gonna be working now in interior design and you wanna turn off certain elements of the interior design that the architecture originally have, you go to the visibility graphics override to the link and then you customize those settings. And that actually ease a lot your, your um, stress because this is always a hot topic, you know, visibility graphs is always right. Now, another challenge that we have is the lack of company standards, project templates standards. As a matter of fact, we're gonna have a coming uh, webinar talking about Revy templates pretty soon. So later on at the end of this, um, webinar, we're going to tell you when and date and time. And it's going to be about understanding how uh, uh, company standards template for Revy projects is important. You know, and it's very important because that is going to be like a, a start point to create any project, uh, especially in architecture or MEP, any any project. So, which approach should we, we consider to create a project template? What would be the best approach? Uh, I mean, need to put everything in the template. What is, are the elements that should be in there? One thing that I wanna point out very clear is this. 
there's not the right or wrong template and there's not a perfect template. Just keep that very clear in mind. Oh, but my company always do the same kind of uh, projects. That's fine, but there's no one size fits all. So you might have two, three different templates always, depending on your company and depending on the kind of fields that you are. So one good uh, startup point to do a template is to get you know information uh, ahead. So things that the template can be for setting up is project information, project settings, view templates that we just discussed a little bit, family content, you know, how many families we need to load it into the template, et cetera. The project views, what are the views? And this is tied up a little bit with the challenge number five that is actually the annoying project browser that sometimes can be very annoying. Visibility graphs over rises and another good one example of what we need to consider when we're creating uh, a standards templates projects and print settings, um, title blocks, annotations, etc. project and share parameters that, and for high end you know, levels of you know how we're doing our uh, project. So I'm going to show you a little bit, a little bit of steps of what will be, you know, the easy way to go to the project someplace and create it once. But this is not necessarily, you know, the best um, for your case, for your company. So just keep it in mind that one thing that usually happens is that, let me go here. We're going to start with a brand new template from the get-go, from the, you know, templates that Revy has here in the genetic ones so would you want to kind of start with one of these if it's architectural design now notice here we have residential and commercial templates now i'm going to open a couple of them i'm going to open this commercial template architectural and i'm going to also uh, go back and open another one new another template i'm going to open this uh, default which is, is also architectural uh, and then go here. So the first thing that you need to keep in mind when you're gonna be creating your templates for your company standards is to understand your field. What is the field that you're working? Are you working in architectural design? Are you working in MEP, structural? So those are the first thing. Notice this uh, default template is very simple, at least in the project browser, very simple. Uh, I have only two levels. So this can be for very, very simple projects. And most likely the level of families loaded here are very few, nothing bad there. The other one, architectural uh, residential, notice here there's a lot more elaborated template. It actually has some sheets already organized. The views are organized in the you know, bottom of the footing, the foundation level, a one and roof, a roof framing, etc. It's a very nice template to start up a residential, but not necessarily the families are all the families that you want to have in your company standard. You probably you use a specific um, manufacturers, you know, uh, kitchen appliances, bathroom appliances, etc. So you and even windows and doors, etc. But this is going to be a good start point, so you can actually. Take this guy, for example, you notice here this is a document already there, but out of the sample, you want to have this with your company standards. So when you're going to start a project template uh, in Revy, you want to start with one of those out of the box uh, templates, six, and probably, you know, start to organize those guys with you. you definitely, you're going to change this title block with yours, company title blocks, et cetera. And uh, all the things that you're going to be now doing there. Now, like I mentioned to you in the prior chart here, uh, we need to kind of establish these settings, you know, when we start to do it. Now, lastly, when you are kind of, okay, this is going to be my start point template. It's not perfect, but I, I'm going to keep working on that. Just remember to save this as a template, not a project. That's the mistake that many people does. They save this as a project, and remember this uh, project is already a RTA, um, RVT, a Revit project file, and not a template. 
templates are RTE format and then going to be storage Aromari in this place or whatever your company, you know, standards are going to be my sample uh, template. So I can access this guy anytime that I'm going to hit new, create new project. Then I'm going to start with that project as a my template company. So when you go here and you browse, you're going to see my sample template with your company standards. And little by little, you can actually uh, build on that template. So one of the last things uh, along with that, that we face a lot as a challenge is the organization of the browser. Notice I give you an example here, some browsers are architectural, structural, MEP. So the field that you work in padding the browser, sometimes the browsers needs to be grouping and sorted out so that we can actually sort it out and grouping this by view, by types. You know, for example, if you're working in a project that is uh, architectural coordinations and other disciplines, you wanna do that. Other times you filter the browser by, you know, disciplines, by the ones, views that are not in the sheets nowadays in the Revit 2022 and 2023, we have this beautiful feature that we can tell now in the project browser, whether the, the view is on the sheet or not, I'm gonna show you that soon. And also by the schemes. So how the scheme can be separated in different um, organization browsers. So one thing is uh, when there, I'm gonna show you this quickly. So when you go to a project browser here, uh, actually you saw that in this, uh, in, in this uh, drawing, the project browser is organized very nicely by the disciplines. So, and you notice that by default, Revy has this very kind of uh, schematic way to do floor plans, ceiling plans, elevation buildings, then sections buildings, etc. Any one of these projects is gonna be doing the same thing and you wanna keep it that way. Me particularly, I like to organize the project browser this way. I'm gonna open this guy. Uh, because this is uh, the levels usually are in alphabetic order. Uh, then sometimes you have the first floor and then the second floor and the second go to the to the first and then things like that. I number the levels naming convention on the project browser so that it will go there. And some companies they do a couple of the things interesting. They have to uh, organize this in two different areas: workable. Uh, views and printable views or uh, views to work or views to be placed on the uh, documents. So what is happening is that uh, people can be working in the same floor plan, but just a part of the working uh, of the model and then have a same duplicate view for the actually same guy just organized already with a specific uh, a scale, etc., that is going to be placed on the document here. So it's going to be placed on the document. So you guys uh, can do that. Many companies do that. It's a very interesting way to organize these elements there. So if you notice here, I'm very, very, very organizational way, 001. So actually, I do this here on my elevation. So when I go to my elevations, I organize this very nice by numbers so that I have this very nice here so that I can identify quickly from the bottom up my uh, floor plans, etc. And then notice here also how here in the uh, in the sheets, everything is well, nice, organized there. Notice here again, floor plans, ceiling plans, 3D views, uh, elevations, etc. So you want to have this very well organized. And this organization means a lot for all of the people that works there. So I hope that this actually gives you some good insight in how to, to come out with solutions to this challenge situation that we sometimes, most of the time face here in the in working with Revit. So those uh, guys that we are talking about, those five challenge situations, usually are easy to overcome if we are 
you know, uh, approach them in the right in the right way, and and always also to look for people to help. I mean, why not? We need to look for people who knows better, who has been experienced in this, and then can us can give us some insight in how we can approach that. But remember that every company has their own. Uh, you know, ways to do things, and then we need to adapt to that too. So I hope that this helped you a little bit. So Alan, let me know. I pass this to you. So I hope that you guys have some good information with this presentation. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, okay, so just a quick reminder before we get into questions, because I haven't gotten too many yet. Uh, if you're looking for continuing education credit, I need you to please go ahead and email over, or I'm sorry, uh, type in in the questions or chat box your uh, name and your AIA number before the end of the presentation, um, or email us after the presentation if necessary, but we will be checking uh, attendance, I believe, on that. Um, additionally, if you have any other questions that you've thought of through the presentation, please go ahead and send those over now in the questions box, and we will get to those very soon, okay? Um, all right, Roger, so the first one here, why is it important to start a project in Revit with a template instead of save as any project similar to the new one? Mm, good question. Yeah, well, it's important. I just mentioned part of that. It's important that we understand that not all of the projects are the same. Yeah, but they're the same. They're the kind of the same the kind of project we do it in the office. And why not to say that project as a pilot? In Revit, it's not a good idea to do that because the project itself has their own information. For example, this project I can uh, go to the manage tab, and then part of the template that I was talking is I can fill up this uh, project info that is, and you can tell it's already filled up for this uh, particular project info. If you save this guy as a second project, uh, make a copy, and then I'm gonna use this as a pilot for the other one, uh, that info carry on to that one. And that info is now for the new, next project is bogus. Uh, another thing is that sometimes we do have for a X and Y particular project, specific you know, uh, families loaded for that project based on the project information, especially for any structural architectural and then the next project not necessarily needs those guys and then we need to still load it those guys whereas if we have a template a RTE already set up for that with the information base information of, of the most relevant information that a company uses all the time then you're gonna save some time there and besides the fact that you're gonna delete that and I'm gonna demonstrate that I'm in the first floor I said, well, I'm gonna use this as my second project. So I'm gonna save us this guy, um, make it, you know, whatever the name that I'm gonna call this number two. For example, this is the project number two. And I'm gonna delete these guys because I'm gonna start up new. So besides the fact that you need to do that, delete, you see when you hit delete, some guys are not gonna be deleted. Some guys are gonna give you warning. Hey, these are, you know, ping, I cannot do that. And if you look at this in 3D too, you didn't delete everything. Maybe the levels are not on the same high, et cetera. So you're gonna waste more time fixing things that actually start from scratch. So good idea to start a project template and make your project template always. It's much better. I hope that that helped and answer that part of that question. Perfect, yes. Um, okay, so here's the next one. Are there any other ways to organize the project browser other than numerical or alphabetical? Um, that was, uh, I think, part of what I showed you here, yeah. Uh, sadly to say, uh, computers usually they do work in two ways, alphabetical and numerical. So usually alphabetical is A, B, C, D, you know, whatever it is. And numerical is always prelude the letters. So the best way would be something similar that I did here. So that you go from uh, whatever you, some some companies actually, they work from the top down, that's fine. Especially structural designers, they do actually from the top down. So they will be the zero one or zero zero, zero one, zero two. That will be the best way. Now, 
keep it in mind, and many people have that idea that uh, the name of the levels in the way that they organize on here on the project browser, not necessarily it's gonna be the same name of the view when you place it on the paper, because if you know about, a little bit about, you see, um, this guy has the same name to um, ground floor, but if you go to that view in particular, among the part of the visibility graph is right here you have the title and sheet that i can call this now you know ground floor design layout so you do that now on the paper this is the two ground floors so you have your organization well done here by numbers instead of uh, alphabetic order and in the paper you're gonna have the right information there. So my response will be straight there. So use numbers, it's gonna help you a lot to keep this organized based on how you wanted to see the, the floor plans from the top down or the, uh, down up, but the numbers always gonna help you better than actually letters. Because the alphabetic order always is kinda of a little bit weird in, in the way that it's organized here. Okay, so perfect. hope that I help. Yep. Okay. Uh, next one. What is um, let's see. Why is it important to have Revit Office standards? Who can do this for us? Well, Office standards is important because each office is different. You know, each corporate organization is different. The actually policy of working and every corporate right it's different so uh, it's not the same to have a template or office standard for a MEP company than for an architectural company so you need to have office standards in Revit standards such as uh, a, let's talk about graphic for example you know the title block with the identity mark of the company you know marketing tools like uh, logos the addresses etc the um, graphic is part of the uh, fonts and uh, styles of the fonts that use even though that in the United States we try to be more for the AIA.org uh, settings for these guys so if you look at the AIA.org you're going to find those standards for also for not only for AutoCAD but also for BIM at Revit um, but uh, the company has some interesting ways to present those guys and have that distinct mark that's going to be important to trans lay those into the office standards template of the Revit. Uh, other things like that, like codes, for example, I know in Miami, we have a lot of codes um, in the city codes. We have a lot of them. We can actually put those guys automatically there as well. So that is why it's important to have those things there. Perfect. And I, I do want to pitch in there as well. You know, if, if that is something that you're looking for for your company, <clears throat> here at uh, at DDS CAD, we do offer those services as well. So you can always reach out to us, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, to speak to your your group about that and and see what we can do to help on that front. Um, okay, next question here: What will be a good project browser organization for an architectural firm? Um, good one. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of them. I think I have. Uh, this medical center done by uh, other people. Look at this project browser here, guys. Uh, so this is, again, it follows the same um, organization that Revit has, you know, floor plans, floor plans, uh, floor plans again, ceiling plans. Here. Now I like this because they have floor plans and large plans. So if you look at these guys, they have these enlarged plans of the bigger one, you know, this large plan second floors. If I go to the second floor, I see this B, you know, building. But I, here I'm focusing uh, this enlarged restroom, and you can tell here that there's actually this guy here. So I can see now the floor plan, the second for presentation. So what's the floor plan presentation is actually different, you know, this here. So I have this uh, with a uh, 
shadows or maybe I don't want to have shadows, uh, but I have a different presentation style here. So you can have these guys in this way and then present it that way. So again, this is gonna be dependent on your company, a uh, way to kind of try to do this. This is a good one. The one that I just showed you with the building, it's another one. So I like to do this. And to be honest, I like to duplicate these guys because I like to work in a specific view. And this view, I can even make it, you know, big scale, one quarter of an inch. It won't impact that much to me, but I'm gonna be able to work and don't worry about what all of these elements are here. You see, this is few specific annotations. If we actually duplicate this guy only, now this copy notice is blank, it's clean. So I don't have all of those uh, annotations there so that I can work here. I can experiment with my, you know, textures, materials, or even actually work in the, act, in the real dimension of this guy, start to understand whether um, my design is going well or not. So I can have this guy, call it, you know, floor workable or work or whatever you want to call it. And this guy, because it's already with dimensions, et cetera, I can name this guy and printable. So what happened is this guy is the one, um, the one that is going to be placed on the paper, on the paper here. So in 2023, we have something very nice in 2023. Notice this little box here. This guy now represents whether this floor plan is placed on the uh, document or not. Uh, this is not, anyone is not placed on document because this still is an schematic design, but this is gonna light up in blue if I place this in a, on a paper. So the best way will be what is really the intent of the architectural firm wants to do. They wanna do some enlarged plans. I will suggest to do this. And this is part of what I was talking in filtered out or sorting out here in the project browser. So you can select here the views and levels and then you can sort it out that based on those elements. Obviously this is part of the template uh, company standards, etc. that a, a Revit manager or a person who knows this is gonna implement it for you. But uh, once it's done and all of the people know exactly how they're gonna work and they know exactly what they're gonna receive or see in every single project that they are continue being exactly this this way, all the way down until you know documents. So this is a very typical way to do, you know, workable and printable. Uh, like I did in the other one, uh, work over on printable, but, but that's not necessarily the, the, the only standards. The standards will be uh, what it works better for the company in the kind of work that they do. They like to do enlarge uh, floor plans or even sections. Then this example here is a very nice one, you know, floor plans and large plans, regular plans and presentation plans and so forth going down. Hope that that helps. A little. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so I um, I think let's go ahead and, and end there because we're getting kind of uh, to the end of the hour here. Uh, so Roger, if I can have you jump to that next slide. So uh, I did want to just go ahead and mention here first. Thank you all for being here so much today. We really appreciate it. Uh, you know, we keep doing these things for you guys. So, so you know, definitely seeing you out here, seeing the support really is something that we appreciate. Um, I did, if you did enjoy today, we do have two more upcoming webinars, which are going to be on November 30th. That's going to be our five skills to master Revit families. And then on December 14th, uh, which is going to be five benefits of using a Revit template. So definitely check in for those. Uh, look out for registration links on those. And again, if you have any additional questions, any anything else that you need from us or that you'd like to reach out to us about, uh, again, around those standards, for example, things like that, and, and uh, your software needs, go ahead and give us a call here at the office at 305-445-6480 and uh, email us at uh, info at ddscad.com. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here and thank you, Roger. No, thank you for having me. I, I have a blast and... Uh... 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.